Welcome to Clinical Minute, Communicating Contraceptive Risk, Switching from the Pill. Vanessa is a 26-year-old Gravita II Para Zero African-American woman. In the past three years, she has had two first trimester medical abortions, when she was 23 and 25. She is generally healthy, and her only current medication is a low-dose estrogen oral contraceptive. You learn from reviewing her health history that Vanessa is heterosexual. She has had four previous partners and has been with her current partner for two months. Additionally, Vanessa's mother currently has breast cancer. Vanessa is at the clinic because she would like to switch from the pill to something else. She explains that she has trouble remembering her pill and usually misses two to three pills per month. What is your first question to Vanessa? When counseling Vanessa on options besides the pill, you use active listening. The first step to active listening is asking open-ended questions. You ask, what is the most important factor for you in your birth control? You then pause, allowing Vanessa to speak. Vanessa replies that she likes having lighter periods. Before beginning birth control, she had heavy periods with excessive cramping. Vanessa likes that the pill helps with that. You then ask, how important is it to you that you not get pregnant in the next year? Vanessa seems surprised and says, I thought that was the most obvious point of birth control. I definitely do not want to get pregnant anytime soon. That's why I'm switching from the pill. To ensure that you understand Vanessa, you next rephrase what she has just said by saying, what I hear you saying is that the most important part of contraception for you is to not get pregnant. You pause, and Vanessa nods her head. You continue, and the second most important thing to you is to have a lighter period. Is that right? You pause again, and Vanessa agrees with what you have just said. Now that you have worked with Vanessa to clarify goals, what is your next step? When helping a patient select birth control, it is important to engage in shared decision-making. According to the Informed Medical Decisions Foundation, shared decision-making is a collaborative process that allows patients and their providers to make healthcare decisions together. It takes into account the best clinical evidence available, as well as the patient's values and preferences. Shared decision-making is not a goal. The goal is better health decisions to achieve outcomes that matter most to the patient, and shared decision-making is a way to reach that goal. To use shared decision-making, you and Vanessa will discuss the options, the accompanying evidence for safety and efficacy, and then Vanessa's values and preferences. Because Vanessa has indicated that efficacy is the most important factor for her, you begin counseling with a tier-based tool. There are many tier-based counseling tools available. The CDC tool is shown here. Bedsider.org and the World Health Organization are additional resources for tier-based counseling charts. You say to Vanessa, you mentioned that effectiveness is a priority for you. I have a chart here that shows how effective various methods of birth control are. You begin by pointing out that the implant and the IUD are the most effective reversible forms of contraception. For every 100 women using IUDs, less than one will get pregnant. You also provide Vanessa with hands-on models of the various types of birth control, including the implant, IUD, and the ring. Vanessa looks at the chart and seems a little disappointed. You ask if she has any questions. Vanessa explains, I had been thinking that I would like to switch to the ring, but according to this chart, it's not any more effective than the pill. I'd like to avoid implants and IUDs because my mom has breast cancer, and I've seen that they can cause cancer. What is your response? You know that there are various methods of calculating risk. Absolute risk is the first method listed here and is identical to the incidence of an event. For example, for breast cancer and contraceptives, the absolute risk would be the number of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer per population group. For birth control, absolute risk is usually expressed per 1,000 women years. Woman year is a term commonly used in risk calculations 
and indicates one year of exposure to the risk of pregnancy. 1,000 women years could mean 1,000 women over one year of use or 100 women over 10 years of use. Relative risk and odds ratio calculations are similar to one another. They indicate the incidence or odds of a condition compared with another group. In the case of contraceptive use, the comparison group could be non-users of contraception, never users of contraception, or even users of a different type of contraception. When evaluating relative risk and odds ratio calculations, it is important to know the comparison group. As can be seen at the bottom of the slide, relative risk and odds ratio calculations are evaluated relative to one, which would indicate neither harm nor benefit. A calculation of less than one would indicate that contraception may lead to benefit, and a calculation of more than one would indicate that a contraception may lead to harm. The data on breast cancer risks in contraceptive users are conflicting. Most large, well-controlled epidemiologic studies have not demonstrated a link between contraceptive use and breast cancer later in life. As seen in the table, two large prospective cohort studies found a relative risk close to one, which means that there is no, or possibly a very small, increase in the risk of breast cancer in users of hormonal contraception. In a meta-analysis by Zhu et al., researchers found that the duration of use of birth control may affect its association with breast cancer. Long-term users had a 14% increased risk of cancer compared with non-users, whereas ever-users had an 8% increased risk. Many other studies have shown that the risk of breast cancer may return to baseline after halting the use of contraception. Importantly, no randomized controlled trials evaluating breast cancer risk in users of oral contraceptives have been done. It is unlikely that these trials will be done in the future, so we are limited by the evidence that we have available. While well-controlled prospective, case control, and retrospective studies can be informative, they do carry inherent limitations. There is some evidence that the formulation of contraception impacts the risk of breast cancer. For example, a case control study of over 1,000 contraceptive users with breast cancer and 20,000 controls revealed that oral contraceptive use within the last year led to an odds ratio of 1.5, indicating an increased risk of breast cancer. However, low-dose estrogen pills had a relative risk of 1.0, indicating no change in risk. High-dose pills, which showed an increase in risk, are rarely used in practice today. Similarly, hormonal IUDs were compared with copper IUDs in a large retrospective study. In this trial, there was no difference in breast cancer risk between the two types of IUDs with odds ratios of 0.99 and 0.85 for ever use and current use, respectively. This study is very important because there have been other studies that compared women who use hormonal IUDs with the general public. In these studies, women who use hormonal IUDs are at an increased risk for breast cancer, but this does not take into account the fact that hormonal IUDs are often used for women with heavy menstrual cycles. These women may have other risk factors for breast cancer that are not controlled for when comparing them with the general population. It is important to note that other progestin-only forms of contraception, such as implants and injections, have not been linked to breast cancer in the research literature. When discussing the association between contraception and breast cancer, it's important to communicate clearly. You can use different ways to explain numerical data. For example, you can say birth control pills may be associated with a 4% increase in breast cancer. That means that 4 in every 100 women who take birth control may be at increased risk for breast cancer. When discussing increases in risk, such as for thrombotic events and oral contraceptive users, it's important to use absolute risk. Even if there is a small increase in absolute risk, this can translate to a relatively large increase in relative risk for already rare events. For example, 
Contraception increases the risk of thrombotic events by about 350%, with an odds ratio of 3.5. However, the absolute risk of thrombotic events is approximately 1.9 per 10,000 women years. That means the increased risk translated to only 6.7 events per 10,000 women years. One way that you might describe this to the patient is by saying, the risk of a blood clot is pretty low in most healthy women, so that 1 in 150 women will experience a blood clot during their reproductive years if they are not using contraception. This is less than 1% of all women. Taking birth control pills increases that number to about 3 in 150, or about 2% of women. Finally, when discussing risk with patients, Avoid shifting the denominator when using proportions. For example, instead of saying to your patient that 1 in 33 women experience this side effect, it will make more sense to say 3 in 100 women experience this side effect. They both mean 3%, but the latter is easier to understand. Vanessa has just voiced her concern that she has heard implants and IUDs can cause cancer. You begin by asking an open-ended question. Is cancer your number one concern about this form of birth control? Vanessa says yes, indicating that she does like the thought of not having to worry about getting pregnant for a few years after insertion if it weren't for the cancer risks. You know that it's important to explain the potential risks of a birth control method to fully participate in shared decision-making. You explained that there have been some studies that have associated hormonal contraception with cancer. You then explained that most of these studies have actually been on birth control pills. You say, a few studies have looked at IUDs, though. One study that compared copper IUDs with hormonal IUDs found that there was no difference in risk of breast cancer. Studies that have linked IUDs with breast cancer have compared IUD users with the general population. However, this isn't a great comparison group because many women who use IUDs have other risk factors for breast cancer, such as naturally heavy periods. You pause to see if Vanessa has any questions before continuing. Studies that have investigated the shot and the implant have found no association with breast cancer, and studies that have found an increase have also found that this risk goes back down after discontinuing birth control. So it's reversible. You ask, does that make sense? Vanessa picks up the different hands-on models that you've provided of the IUDs and implants. She says that what you've said does make sense, and she likes how small the different devices are. She's still undecided about which one will work best for her, but she's more interested in hearing about the implant, since she is less worried about the cancer risks. To encourage informed decision-making, you discuss both the benefits and the risks of the implant with Vanessa. Because the implant has many benefits and fairly low risks, you begin with the benefits. You explain that the implant is one of the most effective forms of birth control, and less than 1% of women using it will get pregnant. Since having a lighter period was important to Vanessa, you tell her that many women experience lighter periods, and some women don't have a period at all after the first year. You also tell Vanessa that the implant will last for up to four years and can be easily removed should she change her mind or decide she'd like to get pregnant. Because Vanessa was concerned about cancer, you add that progestin-only implants may actually reduce the risk of endometrial cancer. You also want Vanessa to know about more common side effects. You say, you should know that the most common side effects of the implant are changes to the menstrual cycle. Your period could become heavier or lighter, particularly in the first three to six months. You may also have spotting between periods. This will usually normalize in the first year. If you do experience spotting, I recommend that you take two 200 mg ibuprofen every six hours, which can reduce the bleeding. You remind Vanessa that the implant will not protect against STIs by saying, the implant does not protect against HIV infection and other sexually transmitted infections. It's important to use condoms to protect yourself. To ensure that Vanessa has understood your instructions, you say, 
I want to make sure that I've done a good job explaining this. Can you tell me what the most common side effect of the implant is and the best way to treat it? Vanessa repeats the information back to you correctly and seems excited about the switch to the implant. She asks, when can I switch from the pill? Because you know same-day insertion reduces the risks of unintended pregnancy, you offer to insert it that day. You instruct Vanessa to use a backup method of birth control for the first seven days to avoid pregnancy. After the insertion, you give Vanessa instructions on post-insertion care. You tell her, you can go back to your normal activities immediately, but you should know that bruising, swelling, and soreness are common for the first two weeks. You instruct Vanessa to keep the site dry and leave the bandage on for two days. You also tell her that redness or oozing are signs of infection, and she should call the clinic if she experiences these symptoms. Finally, you remind Vanessa one more time about backup birth control for the first week and condom use to prevent infections. You let Vanessa know to call the clinic with any concerns and to come back if she experiences problems. You reassure Vanessa that the implant can be removed at any time should she change her mind. Vanessa returns to the clinic three months post-insertion due to irregular spotting. After eliminating other causes of breakthrough bleeding, such as pregnancy or pathologic causes, you engage in active listening and ask Vanessa, how much is the bleeding bothering you? She says that it's more annoying than anything else, but she would like it to stop. You explain that there is no approved treatment for breakthrough bleeding and ask whether she has been using ibuprofen when bleeding starts. Vanessa indicates that she does most days, but she forgets to take it three times a day. You encourage Vanessa to continue with the ibuprofen and also offer to prescribe a combined oral contraception, or COC, for three months, which might help. You explain to Vanessa that the pills are low stakes meaning that the implant is still providing contraception, so there is no risk of pregnancy should she forget to take the pills. However, the pills should help to stabilize her periods. Because it is important to not make Vanessa feel trapped with her lark, you also offer to remove the implant. Vanessa is interested in the option of oral contraceptives. She says, that would be great. It's been nice not having to take a pill every day, but I guess if it's just for three months, then I can do it, especially if it means I can keep my implant. You explain to Vanessa that these pills should help to stabilize her periods by providing a consistent dose of combined estrogen and progestin. You tell her that this is an off-label use of the pill, meaning that it has not been approved specifically for this use. However, it has been shown in research to help with bleeding. You prescribe three months of COCs and instruct Vanessa to call the clinic at the end of the three months to check in. Vanessa leaves the clinic remarking, I hope that this fixes the problem. I'm really liking the freedom that the implant has given me.